for us, because we're connected to you guys, it was mostly like we was glad to see y'all come back. And that's the beauty of it, you know. So when y'all go out there and y'all start going through things, and man, you know how your coaches are. Y'all know the things y'all finna go through. Then y'all gonna be going different levels. And whether you go from uh, 10th grade to 11th grade, 11th grade, 12th grade, 12th grade to college, somebody's always gonna be, do this, do this, run here, run there. Da, da, da. So, you know what I'm saying? Sometimes don't even get all caught up in that. Sometimes just come to work just to do your work, you know? And then when you, when you become, like I told you, a, a real leader, real leader serve. So when you become a server, you forget self. You forget self. And that's what, you know, kind of something I did for my whole career. I started to forget myself. I was like, okay, Lou, don't be selfish today. You know, I can come here with attitude. I can be having mindset early. I can be having problems at home. I can be having this, that. But don't worry about that. Somebody else going through something way worse than you. So it's come picking them up. And that's what happened today. You started to see that. Even when guys found themselves tired, Y'all forgot about yourself and said, let me go get somebody else. Come on, bro, you still can make it. Come on, man, don't sit up under the tent. Come on, man, don't, yeah. And that's what starts to happen, man, when you really start to buy into, really, it's, it's buying into yourself. It ain't buying into, per se, a program. It's buying into what I believe in, what my mindset is going to be at the end of the day, or what my mindset when I walk out here in day two. What am I going to give? to give it everything I got. Because if you give it everything you got, I, I've always said this, you sleep better at night. You sleep better at night because one, one, uh, once you empty yourself out, that's the reward. That's the reward. And that's why I say that when I saw finish at that finish line today, you appreciate that down the road because you would know what finish it mean and you would know what being a leader means. It, 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 it actually was a dance um, in our hometown in, in uh, Polk County area close to Tampa, Tampa and Lakeland and all that area. It was called, the dance was called a squirrel. And um, this retired military vet named Kirby Lee, he, uh, he came back from the war and it really like, you know, messed his head up and everything. So a lot of people, you know, kind of turned their backs on him because he was like a little different, you know? And, uh, and I just, I actually fell in love with him you know, just by his spirit and who he was as a man, regardless on what he was going through mentally. So he used to always come around and, and he's the one of the biggest fans I have. You know, he has my, my face, my uh, thing tattooed on his, on his shoulder. Um, and Kirby Lee's so funny about, you know, like I said, he's, he's dealing with some mental issues, but he's, he understands clearly. So he started doing this dance, you know, he started doing the scroll, doing the scroll, whatever. And then uh, one day I just told him, I said, uh, I said, you know what, Kurt? I said, I'm going to do that dance. I said, I'm going to do it on TV. And then he was like, nah, no, you're not. I said, I'm going to do it. And then one time, um, uh, 98, 98, uh, they introduced the offense and defense separately. And they called out the defense. And then Marvin was like, I want you last. And I came out last, and then for the first time, you know, the fans was cranked, it was crazy. And then I done the dance. And when I done it, I mean, our website and the Ravens website went crazy. You know, and the fans in the, in the stadium went crazy, like, you gotta do it every Sunday, you gotta do it every Sunday. So then it turned into this thing in Baltimore. It was just a Baltimore thing at first, to where, you know, they just wanted me to do it, wanted me to do it. So I started doing it, then I started adding music to it. Then I started to add movies to it, you know, so then it turned into his own animal. And then that's how that dance was started. You could do different body parts every day, but you know, our program is probably Monday, Wednesday, and Friday, you know, but it depends on what your load is. There's sometimes we'll go real, real hard. So we'll take a two day break, you know, because you just need to totally recover. Um, I told you guys just yesterday, most important thing to, to lift and weights and all that stuff is pure recovery. Because weights, I'm telling you, weights is good. It, it makes your body look good. But weights, we weren't made to lift weights. You know, that's why push-ups, that's why we emphasize on push-ups so much, because that's natural strength. You know, you ain't, you ain't really messing with nothing. You know, just like myself. I mean, even though I made it 17 years, I still have, you know, pains from weights. Just pure weights, you know, because the heavier you go, the more strain you put on your muscles. So you got to be very careful with how much you lift during the week, and you got to kind of spread it out. Uh, pretty much how we do Monday, Wednesdays, and Fridays. You know, so when I tore my tricep, um, you know, the doctor put me to the sideline, and she was like, Ray, your season is over. 
you know, and I'm like, you don't, you can't tell me that, you know, no man can tell me that, you know, or woman, because she was a woman when she told me, but, and, <laughs> but, <laughs> but, but, um, but it was, you know, of course it was sad, it was devastating, because I know how I wanted to end my last year, I wanted to play all games and do all those things, but when it happened, it happened. So what you do, you cry, you get, in, you get in your pity parties, you feel sorry for yourself, or you can make up your mind. And I made up my mind the day I tore it, standing on the field and I'm watching it, and I said, I'll be back. She was like, Ray, your tricep is torn off the bone. I said, I'll be back, and I'll see you in the Super Bowl. She was like, Ray, you, I'm, she's like, just come see me tomorrow, we take an MRI, we see how bad it is, and we go from there. And I got there, man, and she showed me the MRI, and she said, look, you see this? You see all this white? And I was like, yeah. She was like, it's gone. It's all the way off the bone. It's way up here, and you're going to have to have surgery. I grabbed my papers. I asked her to give me my papers, and I said, doc, I'm on blind faith. And you understand this when y'all get older. Faith of these, the things, the substance of the things unseen, what you can't see. And I, and I couldn't see it. I just knew what I believed in. And I've always believed in my relationship with God, that anything that I have the desires in my heart that he had give to me. And I knew it based off my work ethic, based off of the way I ate, which was important, based off the way I train, the way I take care of my body. I was like, okay, everybody else, normally, you're right. They might be out for this tricep, but I'm not, I'm not finna sit out the entire year talking about a tricep injury, you know? So when I grabbed my papers, I said, doc, I'm on blind faith. I got on the first flight back home to Miami, because uh, that's where my college doctor had done all my surgeries. And I flew to him, and he said, and Dr. Reby said this, and he's always been honest with me. He said, I know what you're going to do. He said, but it's the ultimate risk for your career. And I said, Doc, whatever it is, I said, I just need you to repair it the best way you can and let me deal with that other part. Because he knew I was going to come back. He knew it. He done, he done done all, I had seven surgeries, so he knew all seven of my surgeries, he knew that I was going to come back regardless. So I never let the bad side get to me because the next day I was on a flight to get this repaired and I was five days, three days from there, I was driving for a flu to Orlando because my son was playing high, his last high school uh, games and I flew to Orlando with my whole arm in a cast like this. The, the heck with the pain, the pain is irrelevant. I need to see my child. You see, so once I did that, I had already had my next thing scheduled to go to, you know, get get the cast off and keep moving. And from there, man, after 10 days, 10 days of surgery, I had sleeves pulled up and I was riding my bicycle after 10 days because I knew I was going to come back regardless. I didn't care about the pain, you know, and that's why I was telling y'all guys about pain. Sometimes you got to make pain your best friend. You know, that's the only way to, to defeat pain is actually recognize that pain exists. You see, it's when you try to deny pain that pain really hurts. Sometimes you got to invite pain. And at this time, regardless, because I was going to retire anyway, I was going to finish it my way. I wasn't going to finish it based off all of the critics and everybody. Oh, his career is done. Nobody has ever came back from a tricep injury. He is done. He, he is too old to do this. You know, he, he, can, he cannot recover from this. And I listened to every one of those people. And every time I got on my back and every time I went back in that weight room, I said, they're going to have to see me in a couple of months. You know, but I do understand why now it had to happen the way it happened. I've forgiven my father, you heard me tell me that yesterday. I rode six hours with him to a trip in North Carolina and I never said a mumbling word. I just got in the car and I said, whatever you want to say to me, say it. But after today, I'm done with yesterday. Every, every memory, every pain I ever been through without you not being there. Erase it from my heart. I won't count it against you, whatever. But from this point, don't ask me for nothing, but love me as a father. Because as a son, I don't care how old you get, you're still a son, you know, and it's still yes sir, and it's still respect them to the utmost. And I've never went back one time to have a conversation with my father to say, man, you left me. You know what I'm saying? I don't, I, once I gave that up, I gave it up. So the man I became, I became the man because that's the way God planned my journey. You know, and just, I just stuck with the course. You know, Ed being from Miami, um, and me being a fan of his anyway, coming from the U, 
when he got to me, my only job was to be his big brother. You know, my only job was to take Ed in and, you know, this was when Ed had, uh, just ironic that you asked this question, it has nothing to do with you, but I went to Ed and I said, Ed, listen, you can be one of the greatest safeties to ever do this game, you know, but your image is going to have to change a little bit, you know, because you, you play the game the way we play, you bad boy football, you know what I'm saying? I was like, look, you got to cut out your dreads. You know, you got to start dressing better. We got to we got to speak. We got to practice on speaking. We got to do all that. So I took him under, and Mont just left. But me and Mont, we saw the air came came right up under me. He wouldn't leave my hip. Boom, boom, boom for years. And everything I did, then he just started living with me. And I was like, look, I don't need your money. You just let me take care of everything for us. And I just put him up under. And I just catered him all the way up until being being that man that that now you see. And that's why. But that, that's how UM is. That's how UM is, man. We have a strong brotherhood and a, and a great following with each other that we don't want to disappoint or leave each other out there. And he was one of the ones I wanted to see do great things. Steve McNair, rest in peace. Steve McNair, he floated the ball. I show you, matter of fact, uh, next year, uh, um, 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 most of y'all will be back. I'm going to find this play for you. Eddie was trying to read the ball but saw me coming. <laughs> and that ball touched Eddie George's hands. And I'm telling you, as a backer, one of the sweetest hits you can hit somebody is right here in the ear hole because it stops the ear hole, it clogs him up. And, I, and by the time he touched it, by the time he touched it, I'm telling you some true stuff. Everything, every pain that I had ever been through in my life, I let go on him that day <laughs> on that one hit. And I'm telling you, and that play, that play, that boy laid on the ground, and I waved him, so I say, come get him. He done forever. <laughs> now, that ain't, I'm just telling you, I'm the, I know that, you know, we, we, oh, we in a rough sport, but, you know, some things in life motivate you differently, and that conversation and what had happened in that Super Bowl, how it led up and all of this, that was a... That was a defining moment for our season because they was the big dogs of our conference. They was defending, you know, they had just lost the Super Bowl. They was trying to go back to a Super Bowl, and we couldn't beat Tennessee for whatever reason, man. We would always split with them, but in the playoffs, we would always lose to them. And that one game is when, after I hit him, that pick came next. And, and, and you can hear rat piss on cotton in that stadium after that. Oh, that's that screen. Right here, it's over. <laughs> come on, come on. <laughs> I'm saying, wait, do you? I wish they show up from the side. Watch this. Watch where I come from. Watch this. <laughs> Never been the same since. <laughs> <laughs> I'm gone.